Risto here with George Mason University. Uh, we're talking to Dr. Senlin Chen today. Uh, Senlin is an associate professor at Louisiana State University. Uh, this podcast stemmed from a request by a listener through Twitter uh, who suggested that we highlight a little bit more of the CSPAP work uh, and recommended Dr. Chen's piece. Um, so I loved getting these. Uh, I'm happy to got, uh, we got it aligned. So Here we go with another episode of Playing with Research in Health and Physical Education. That is a dial tone. You have not heard that dial tone on this podcast before because typically I do this in other formats. Uh, Today, we had a lot of technical difficulties. I didn't want to waste Senlin's time. Uh, So we did this over phone, and uh, I do apologize for the audio quality, but the content's still there, um, and um, I need to call the IT department here to uh, figure this out. But uh, let's uh, get on with it, and thank you for your understanding. So we're here with Dr. Senlin Chen from LSU, and we're here to discuss his article, which is titled uh, Toward Active Living, Comprehensive School Physical Activity Program Research and Implications. It was published in 2017 in Quest. So welcome to the podcast, and uh, thanks for taking the time to chat about your paper. Oh, you're welcome, Risto. Um, Thanks for the invite, and uh, uh, hi, listeners. Uh, It's my uh, full pleasure to be here uh, using uh, such a creative and uh, modern way to uh, talk about research. Uh, this is my first time doing um, an interview like this. Uh, so again, i um, um, happy to be here. Uh, first uh, and foremost, I'd like to acknowledge my co-author, uh, Dr. Xiangli Gu, uh, for her contribution to the paper. Uh, Xiangli was a, uh, an assistant professor at the uh, University of North uh, Texas at the time of conducting this review. And she recently moved to the University of Texas at Arlington. Um, I also would like to take this opportunity to acknowledge my senior doctor student who uh, is not a co-author of the paper, uh, Yang Liu, uh, who helped me uh, search the literature during the early stage. And the paper uh, was published uh, first online uh, in Quest back in 2017. Uh, it didn't uh, come out in print until last year, 2018. Awesome. Uh, thanks for that. So the paper you published is a review of literature of CSPAP, uh, which stands for Comprehensive School Physical Activity Program. Uh, and I think reviews are great resources to provide just an overall understanding of what we know so far, and they help us guide in knowing kind of where, where to go with future research. Now, before we get into what we know, uh, let's just cover the basics. Can you explain what CSPAP is and where this where this term came from? Uh, definitely, yeah. Uh, CSPAP uh, stands for uh, Comprehensive uh, School Physical Activity Program. Uh, the acronym uh, actually was proposed uh, by the CDC in 2013 uh, in conjunction with uh, Shape America. Uh, as the name suggests, uh, CSPAP involves uh, schools as the, the hub for promoting physical activity in youth. Uh, CISPAP begins with uh, C, which stands for comprehensive, uh, meaning the approach is not singular uh, or you know, taking place in one particular setting alone, uh, but it requires multiple ecological levels uh, of influence across multiple settings and even components uh, in coordination. And uh, the main goal of CISPAP is for uh, school-aged kids to achieve a minimum of 60 minutes of NVPA per day, uh, in addition to a number of other educational outcomes or goals, such as uh, knowledge, skills, confidence uh, needed for lifetime physical activity participation. Um, well, this comprehensive approach is very important because, uh, as you all know, behavior change is very, very difficult and which is also a subject to influences from a variety of different environmental factors. Okay, so why did you choose to do this review now? Why, why is it important now? Um, 
Yeah, we uh, we had a couple of rationales, and uh, uh, the first and the most uh, I will call it uh, direct rationale, in fact, uh, uh, is not within the paper. Actually, uh, the paper was an outcome of our uh, lead review for a grant proposal uh, back in 2016. Uh, we submitted to the National Institutes of Health, and at the time, we felt uh, we did a pretty thorough job in uh, reviewing and also understanding the uh, uh, the literature. And therefore, we uh, method- methodologically we followed a, a systematic uh, protocol to search, uh, identify, uh, screen, and also summarize the articles. And uh, so, therefore, we had uh, the articles extracted in uh, Excel uh, along with a annotated bibliography. And you know, to your point, the more we wrestled with the literature, the more needed we uh, we thought. Hey, uh, Shani, let's write it up and uh, send it out for peer review. And yeah, that was the first rationale, which was pretty practical, uh, coming out of a literature review for a a grant proposal. And the second rationale was uh, actually pretty theoretical. And, you know, CISPAP is such an important and timely topic. And Heather Irwin et al. uh, published a very nice review paper uh, on CISPAP. Uh, also in, re- in, in quest uh, in 2013. Uh, but since then, uh, there had been uh, a number of additional papers coming out uh, to talk about uh, new progress made in the field. Uh, and then uh, afterwards, Shani and I you know, touched base and decided to uh, publish the review paper uh, to uh, fill the, the gap in the literature. Yeah, so, so that... yeah, those are the two, two rationales we, <laughs> we so had. So it seems like a very... A great situation coming out of a grant proposal to then also get a publication out of a, out of that at the same time. So, um, so your your purpose was to examine the literature on CSPAP and understand the status of research studies and other scholarly work, and that kind of points out directions for future research and practice. Uh, can you explain briefly what you did in the in the review? Uh-huh. Uh huh. Yeah. Long story short, uh, we we uh, we did a ex- pretty extensive lit review, um, you know, in hopes of understanding the the status of uh, existing scholarship on CISPAP. And you know, back then we had uh, a few general questions driving uh, our action. And the first question we had was, Hey, what's the theoretical foundation of CISPAP? Um, uh, why is CISPAP CISPAP, and why is CISPAP uh, becoming such a a big deal, and we uh, really wanted to get to the foundation of it, and yeah. And number two was, uh, does CISPAP actually work, and to what extent does it work in terms of changing uh, physical activity behavior, and also in terms of uh, uh, its influence on uh, other relevant outcome variables. And yeah, and then number three, we uh, uh, we were wondering, uh, you know. Where does PE or the physical educator stand uh, within the CISPAP model? And lastly, uh, the fourth question was, you know, if somebody was going to implement uh, a CISPAP um, program uh, in their school, how, how do they implement the program uh, uh, success, su- uh, successfully? Excuse me. And uh, what, what can we do to train teachers, uh, you know, during uh, teacher education phase and then what are some things uh, we can do during the in-service stage uh, when the teachers are already on their jobs? Uh, just for the for the uh, methodology, we want it to be we want the methodologies to uh, the methodolog- methodological uh, procedures to be uh, replicable uh, and reliable. So um, we met uh, numerous times to develop a protocol uh, for the literature review, and uh, uh, we actually tried to exhaust the the existing literature so that our findings could be more uh, reliable and also informative. Uh, you know, and so instead of doing one round of search, we actually did three rounds of literature search, uh, which was uh, it was a lot of work. Yeah, I, I can believe that we're doing a lit review now and it's, you know, it is exhausting, especially looking at you doing three rounds. But I think, uh, you know, I relate to a lot of those questions of how, how to implement CSPAP uh, you know, we talk about that with Mason now of how much should we be pushing 
the the CSPAP literature into our classes and you know are we supposed to be training our teachers to be able to deliver CSPAP or just deliver physical education or should we even have specific classes on how to run after school programs and so I think you know you bring up really really important topics um, so going into your paper you had 54 articles at the end you coded them for content and at the end uh, you had the following themes so uh, the theoretical foundations of CSPAP um, the effects of CSPAP on physical activity and the relevant outcomes uh, number three is the role of school PE and PE teachers in the context of CSPAP and the and then the key to successful CSPAP implementation in schools. Can you kind of give an overview of the findings and then we can go one by one with the themes? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, so basically, you know, the four findings or the, fi the, the four themes, they were driven by uh, the four guiding questions we had in mind uh, before we started the literature search. Um, you know, those questions also you know, they, they led to the, uh, the research aims of the, the proposal we put together. Uh, yeah, they, well, the paper has a whole lot of information, um, um, and I'm ready to delve into the details if you are, Risto. Yeah, so let's, let's just go uh, theme by theme. So the first theme was about the theoretical, uh, theoretical foundation of CSPAP. And you speak to the fact that the model was built on a strong theoretical foundation and actually sits on over three decades of research on youth uh, physical activity. Um, and then you then uh, bring up the fact that it's just uh, setting the components into a school doesn't mean that the model works. You can't just like plop it in and, you know, magic happens. Um, can you talk about the behavior change piece? I know Aaron Santeo did a podcast on this model already, the whole school model, but maybe you can give us a, um, you know, overview of the social ecological perspective that CSPAP is founded on. Yes, uh, the uh, social ecological perspective uh, basically originated from uh, Yuri um, Brenner's work uh, in developmental psychology uh, in the 1960s and 70s. Uh, and I first learned this content, this model, uh, this perspective from um, program evaluation uh, class uh, taught by my uh, former mentor, Dr. Ang Chen, and also uh, an educational psychology course I took back in 2009-2010-ish uh, um, uh, during my doctor study at UNC Greensboro. And the original uh, uh, model has been adapted into numerous applied fields, including physical activity, uh, health promotion. And the model basically uh, elaborates on, um, you know, how different layers of, of envir environments uh, uh, would work individually and also collectively to influence, to influence and change human behaviors. And I'm sure Aaron has done a, a thorough job uh, you know, articulating this model, uh, just based upon uh, my knowledge of her, uh, she always does very good work, and you know, so I won't repeat her uh, her points here. Uh, so I would rather to talk a little bit more uh, uh, about the the two other, um, you know, theoretical frameworks or models, uh, which are more specific to CISPAP. Uh, uh, well, you know, the the backbone of the CISPAP is the social ecological perspective, and and a CISPAP was culminated after, based upon, you know, over three decades of research on uh, school-based physical activity promotion uh, in youth. And so I have to say CISPAP wasn't built in a day, just like uh, Rome wasn't built in a day. Um, so in 2014, um, uh, Ross Carson, uh, Darla Castelli, uh, uh, Aaron Beagle, and uh, Heather Irwin, they put together a conceptual model based upon uh, prior research. Uh, they articulated a CISPAP, uh, the CISPAP model, uh, the conceptual framework uh, guiding uh, research and practice in this uh, in this particular area. And then a year later, uh, Colin Webster and his colleagues proposed uh, uh, a newer model, which from a slightly different perspective, uh, which was a conceptual partnership model. Um, so in, within this model, they proposed uh, three different types of partnerships. Uh, that university researchers, 
uh, can work with uh, schools and communities uh, to put forth uh, effective and also sustainable CISPAP uh, programs. And uh, these theoretical foundations are very meaningful to public health uh, in general and uh, also to the scholarship and the practice of CISPAP in particular. Uh, yeah, these are the, the two more recent theoretical models which are uh, instrumental to CISPAP research. Right. And it's interesting that, you know, these models are coming out now. We have a ton of research on youth, physical activity, and then we're now putting this model together, putting the research uh, research behind it, really. Um, so when we look at your second theme, it was the effect of CSPAP interventions on physical activity. Um, you found that some of the five components of CSPAP were studied more than others. Uh, and I can kind of you know, guess which ones those are. Uh, so specifically, the evidence supporting the role of staff involvement and family and community engagement was limited. Um, what, what research has been done since that last review uh, on this? Um, well, essentially, this was my, uh, this, the, my second, uh, you know, general question uh, uh, driving our research action. So we were wondering, you know, to what extent does CISPAP uh, work uh, in terms of uh, influencing uh, physical activity behavior among youth? And um, yeah, in short, uh, CISPAP interventions typically uh, have used two types of uh, uh, intervention approaches. Uh, one is um, professional development, uh, in which uh, researchers would train uh, you know, practitioners such as PE teachers and uh, on how to implement uh, CISPAP and then the teachers would, um, after receiving the training from those workshops and then uh, it is hoped that they will be able to, you know, deliver uh, effective CISPAP uh, programs. And then the other approach is uh, called the physical activity programming. Uh, in which the researchers uh, working, ideally working in conjunction with practitioners, uh, extension uh, specialists, they can come up with um, effective uh, program uh, programs, uh, or you know they can enhance or improve the existing uh, physical activity programs, such as PE recess, um, you know before after school uh, programs. And yeah, using these two types of uh, intervention approaches, uh, CISPAP. Uh, intervention, the conclusion is that they have significant uh, in effect on physical activity, uh, but the effect size often uh, is not very uh, substantial. It's actually very small. Um, you know, and you know, as you said earlier, yes, uh, some of the components uh, of CISPAP, such as uh, physical education, uh, classroom, before after school physical activity programs, uh, they have been studied uh, more thoroughly in research than uh, other components, such as uh, using, uh, you know, involving school staff and also involving parents uh, and community resources. Uh, well, one major update um, uh, since the um, lit review from um, Irving at all 2013 was, uh, the, you know, at least the, the two theoretical models or the frameworks from uh, Carson et al. and uh, Webster et al. were not available back then uh, in 2013 because uh, one came out in um, 2014 and the, the other one came out uh, uh, the year after 2015. And uh, the second update was CISPAP was adopted by the CDC and SHAPE uh, since 2013. Uh, which was also uh, a, a similar idea to the whole of school approach from the IOM, uh, Institute of Medicine. And after then, the CDC started giving grants to schools to uh, implement CISPAP and also to provide, um, you know, workshop, workshops to train uh, teachers to become uh, POWs, uh, which stands for physical activity leaders at the state level. Uh, to make changes in schools. And, you know, these theoretical and the political updates uh, uh, really cradled uh, more in empirical research uh, that needed to be summarized, uh, including, you know, uh, the switch project that I have been actively involved in in Iowa and in Louisiana. 
And uh, also since 2013, uh, Joe Bird and uh, JTPE, they have published um, uh, separate um, spatial issues on CISPAP. Uh, CISPAP research has really uh, thrived since 2013. Uh, you know, although it was only about three and three and a half years of um, uh, time, uh, you know, we were able to find a lot of research on the topic, and therefore uh, we felt, you know, it was uh, timely and feasible to maybe write another uh, another review paper on it. Right, and we highlighted the switch program on one of the previous um, uh, podcasts, so the listeners can kind of listen to that and understand the depth of work on that as well. But I'll, I'm going to ask you a little side question here. Why do you think that those other um, other pieces haven't been studied as much? The s- school staff involvement, the family and community engagement, because it's it's interesting. You have this CSPAP model. It's got its parts, but then most of the research that we've done has been on PE and classroom and before and after school programs. But that's not the whole model. So, and and I don't know if you have a a scientifically backed answer, but I just wanted to kind of get your opinion on that before we go into that third theme. What do you think? Um, I'm not, uh, yeah, I, I, you know, my understanding is based upon uh, my experience in the field uh, in the last uh, almost 10 years of research um, in as a faculty member. And it is, you know, the, the level of difficulty, uh, you know, by involving parents and community resources, community leaders, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's just too, uh, it's very high. Um, you know, dealing with uh, school is often a um, place to go in terms of t- targeting physical activity behaviors. Right. And- uh, but that, be- uh, that being said, you know, there are a lot of research studies uh, that have looked at, you know, multiple settings, uh, including including the school, uh, school environments, uh, families, and also uh, community. Uh, but those research studies, they often are not, um, um, you know, consistent with the CSPAP uh, uh, concept. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, there's a lot of difficulty in terms of reaching, um, you know, um, gatekeepers or, you know, agents of changes uh, in a cross multiple settings yeah and absolutely you know researchers would use school as the primary setting to try to reach parents and community leaders and that's what something our switch projects have been doing uh, which is to you know really uh, try to target uh, you know uh, all of the ecological levels of the social ecological perspective uh, the model yeah to it, try it, to yeah, influence the kids uh, physical activity screen time and also you know their diet dietary behaviors right and there is so such a big component that family community component is is huge but you know hopefully there will be a lot more research in that in that area going forward i know that we tried to add a, a parental aspect into our reach after school program and out of 80 parents we got six questionnaires back and the, you know, after every yeah. single way of trying to connect with them, it just wasn't happening. And that might be a testament to how busy parents are these days trying to work and keep up. So, but yeah, let's, let, yep. yeah, let's get into that third theme. So we talked about the effects of uh, the interventions on other outcomes. Uh, what are some other factors that uh, research has looked at with the CSPAT? Uh, well, this was actually uh, another update since uh, the 2013 review uh, from Irving et al. Uh, researchers started to look at a few other factors or variables, such as um, uh, enjoyment of physical activity, uh, health-related physical fitness, uh, classroom behaviors, and uh, uh, step accounts. Uh, step counts. And, uh, you know, uh, Tim Bursu and his crew... Uh, his crew at Utah uh, did a few studies on these variables. Uh, you know, I wasn't able to uh, identify a whole lot of uh, uh, scholarship in this area, you know, looking at the effects of CSPAP on, um, you know, relevant uh, variables other than physical activity. And they found significant uh, pre-to-post changes. And 
but you know I think more research uh, in this area is needed uh, you know looking at uh, excuse me uh, these and uh, also other factors related to physical activity yeah and um, I yeah. and I know it's so, a hot topic so it might be that people are currently doing that research right now and you'll do another review in uh, in a few years so uh, <laughs> So the fourth theme that uh, was the role of school physical education and the PE teacher in CSPAT. And I know Shape America has focused on the PE being the center of the CSPAT model in their kind of approach. Um, so uh-huh. um, can you elaborate on the, on the PE teacher's role on this? Uh, yeah. Uh, you know, if you look at the CSPAT model, uh, PE is actually positioned in the middle. Uh, of the you know the model you know of the five components of CSPAT, uh, P is in the middle, um, and within the school environment, uh, PE uh, and uh, the, the PE teacher or the physical educator uh, is believed to be the uh, to be best positioned uh, to lead CSPAT planning and implementation. Uh, CSPAT scholars have uh, uh, they used to call these leaders as certified uh, DPS. Uh, which stands for Director of Physical Activity, uh, and later uh, PALS, Physical Activity Leaders. And the world of physical activity, uh, if you are familiar with the, the national PE standards, uh, they appear, uh, the world of physical activity appears in four of the five uh, new, new national standards. And physical activity is something in, you know, we deal with every day uh, in PE, right? And Wei Yun Chen and uh, her colleagues at Michigan, uh, they did a study that looked at, uh, you know, the PE teachers' uh, instructional behaviors uh, and a breakdown, I think, uh, eight different uh, elements of uh, the instructional behaviors. And what uh, they found was, you know, those instructional behaviors significantly predicted students' physical activity. Uh, in other words, you know, what the teacher does on one end uh, really matters to the learning and engagement on the student end. And uh, also the Joper and the, spa- uh, and the Joper spatial issue in particular, uh, and also the JDPE uh, spatial issue, um, you know, they published a, a collection of papers on CISPAP, um, uh, which have shown uh, how teacher education programs at the undergraduate level and also pedagogy uh, programs at the graduate level, including master's and PhD, uh, <coughs> excuse me, uh, have revised and reformed uh, their course offerings and even their practica, uh, student teaching experiences uh, to prepare practitioners and researchers to be CISPAP ready. So. Uh, training the physical educator through, um, you know, um, both the pre-service and in-service stages, uh, I believe, is very essential uh, to the process and also to the outcome of of CSPAP. Yeah, and I I hear that a lot. I mean, it's it's it was a big part in the Pete Heat conference as well uh, about trying to figure figure that out, and that was uh, really big out in Salt Lake last year. So. Uh, the last theme you have is about the keys to successful CSPAP implementation. Can you speak to the systems approach that you bring up uh, in order to implement this more successfully? Can you explain that? Yes, for sure. Um, you know, other than having a, a good POW uh, at a school, CSPAP um, uh, as a comprehensive uh, programming uh, requires uh, the, the approach called a system approach. Um, you know, for the sake of time, I won't recite the definition of system uh, here or the system approach. Uh, but uh, Emily Jones said all uh, their 2014 JTP paper uh, has um, a very good definition of it, and they also have done a very interesting uh, feasibility study of uh, you know instituting a CISPAP uh, into you know uh, Appalachian uh, rural schools and which. Which, which was very, very interesting. I uh, highly recommend that article uh, to folks who are interested in CISPAP. Uh, basically, you know, each school can be viewed as a system uh, that consists of uh, a lot of subsystems. Um, you know, within the system of school, uh, you know, there are a lot of people involved. 
uh, including admins such as principals, uh, staff members, uh, teachers of uh, a number of different subjects, um, you know, para professionals and so forth, and also students, right? Uh, but to make something happen and last within the system, uh, particularly at the population level, we're not talking about the individual level, we're talking about the population level, school as a, as a, as a system. <coughs> Uh, some, you know, to make something happen such as physical activity change, uh, the efforts of uh, the power alone uh, is probably not enough. And we also need uh, administrative buy-ins uh, and the resource uh, support from the principal and the, the admins. Right. Uh, you know, efforts from the classroom teachers and staff, uh, coordination and the engagement from parents, uh, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And in other words, you know, successful CISPAP implementation uh, demands concerted efforts from uh, multiple parties uh, with, you know, committed time, energy, and resources within the school system uh, to really make something happen, you know, make effective and sustainable changes. Right. Yeah, it, it definitely speaks to that whole entire model. And, you know, I'm, I'm going to drag you back into that PEEP perspective uh, looking at the, the the higher education piece, I know my colleague Dominique Banville, who's my neighbor in my office here uh, at George Mason, uh, both of us have recently discussed this and we're implementing CSPAP into the coursework now, but we're still trying to figure out what classes it should be taught in and how much to push it. And, you know, this has been around for a while, um, and but I haven't seen it across the board adopted um, of the teaching of CSPAP and PEEP programs? Because I talked to my colleagues and some of them do it, some of them haven't really, some of them dabble in it. Um, so what are the recommendations you laid out for PEEP per- programs in general? Uh, well, first of all, uh, say hello to uh, Dr. Van Wiel. And uh, your, yeah, you got, your, your observation is precisely right. You know, based upon a recent survey, uh, whose results were published in 2013, uh, only a handful of schools uh, at elementary through uh, high school level in the U.S. had used the CISPAP. Uh, Connie Webster at all observed that, uh, you know, most PET programs in the U.S. do do little to prepare PE teachers for becoming CISPAP ready. Uh, (coughs) And probably you can also speak to the fact that, you know, when you uh, walk into the gymnasium, of a, a school uh, in Virginia or you know, um, you know Iowa or Louisiana, you know, unless the school has a system program in, uh, in place, uh, the PE teachers uh, would tell you that they've never heard about the word system before. So mm-hmm. yeah, the observation is uh, is precise. You know, not a lot of people are using CISPAP, uh and even at the PE uh, programs. But uh, yeah, CISPAP requires uh, specialized, uh, you know, uh, pedagogy skills and you know, con- uh, pedagogical content knowledge, right? And these skills and this knowledge, they are not necessarily taught in traditional PIT programs. Um, excuse me. Uh, for instance, a CISPAP trained PE teacher uh, would see uh, physical activity promotion as a, a, um, a holistic system uh, systems approach, right? Instead of seeing this as something only relevant and applicable in PE or in sports coaching. And the PE teacher would need to uh, show um, very good com- uh, communication skills uh, to get the principal on board and also in order to, to work together with, uh, you know, uh, the colleagues, including classroom teachers, parents, uh, and community leaders. And uh, in fact, the, the Joe Bird Special Issue on, on CISPAP published in 2017 um, document, uh, documented the, the infusion of uh, uh, CISPAP training uh, in, I think it's 12 different uh, PIT programs in the U.S. And I encourage you and uh, all those of you who are interested in CISPAP scholarship um, to read those papers. So what are, what are some of the research implications from this, this review that you conducted? Uh, there are uh, a few implications for research. Uh, you know, Xiaoli and I uh, summarized the five uh, implications for research. 
uh, which are um, exhibited in Table 2 of the paper. Uh, you know, for uh, actually four uh, SysPAP implementations with all five components uh, in place are very rare. Uh, in, par in particular, as, uh, as we talked about earlier, uh, the how you know, uh, evolving the, the, the other two components, uh, including uh, uh, staff involvement and family community engagement, uh, you know, very rare. And, you know, we are curious uh, how this full uh, implementation of uh, implementation of four system models uh, um, uh, on physical activity um, behavior. And, yeah, well, well, certainly this kind of research would require uh, larger scale interventions, uh, ideally RCTs or clustered RCTs, uh, which also typically require sizable research funding and resources. And, and the second the main implication for research uh, of this paper is the uh, implementation process, process of a CISPAP um, deserves, uh, deserving uh, further research investigation. Uh, making system changes in the school is never easy, and uh, and ten different schools would probably um, implement a CISPAP in ten different ways, uh, which may be the way you know it's supposed to be, rather than you know you, uh, as a outside um, as a group of researchers who are trying to sell uh, and implement CISPAP in ten different schools, and you know using the one size fits all approach. They may be faced with a lot of uh, resistance and difficulties. <coughs> so, uh, how to motivate and continue to motivate uh, those who are involved in the process at different schools uh, in order to successfully and smoothly implement CISPAP uh, often require a lot of tailored strategies. So, yeah, a lot of research can uh, in this area. Uh, you know, I'm excited to see more research in this area. And the third uh, main research implication is more PEED uh, focused. Uh, as more and more PEED programs are addressing youth physical activity, and you know, gradually increasingly more uh, PEED programs are actually infusing CISPAP into their programs. Um, I, you know, we think it'll be very interesting to see uh, more research on how uh, PEED programs across the country uh, would make changes or make reforms and therefore, you know, shift the pathway uh, towards, you know, training high quality PE teachers and, uh, and make an impact on students' learning. Yeah. Those right. are the three uh, major implications, uh, I think, you know, from based upon uh, our review. Well, maybe you have uh, one research participant as George Mason University as we embark on adding CSPAP and That's right. the more the more I'm talking to you I'm thinking huh maybe we should make a whole entire class on CSPAP just to teach them how to talk to the principal how to prepare how to you know make all of these pieces because it does seem like it can't be peppered in and it's got to be um, a bigger implication so um, what about the practical implications? So obvious answer, I guess, would just be to just get high quality physical education, uh, you know, get all teachers to be CSPAP experts and the PEEP programs aboard. But, you know, how do how do we take the, that? That's three huge steps in quality PE, getting all the teachers to adopt it and getting the PEEP programs aboard. How, how do we how do we do that? Uh, well, the is never going to be easy. Um... You know, um, training. You know, training is the is the key. How do we train uh, teachers, right? Pre-service teachers and in-service teachers uh, through all kinds of uh, opportunities. I think that's that's the key, and that's also something uh, we as pedagogy um, uh, experts have um, uh, the expertise in, right? That we have control over. Uh, so, the, in our paper, we summarized uh, three practical implications and. Uh, so, in terms of the um, pre-service training, uh, Dr. Mike uh, Metzler at all published uh, two separate papers uh, in 2013 in Jobert. Uh, they outlined uh, the specific knowledge and skills required uh, uh, for you know future practitioners to be uh, CISPAP ready. 
And, you know, also, as I said before, uh, a few uh, PIT programs, including George Mason, uh, also have pioneered the infusion of CSPAP training for teacher education. <coughs> and, uh, you know, we would like to see more and more uh, pre-service PE teachers uh, receiving such training before they even uh, taking on their first job uh, in schools. So, yeah, so the, the practical implication of this uh, paper uh, is, you know, good CSPAP implementation uh, requires uh, very well-trained CSPAP practitioners. And, you know, this action is to uh, take start uh, during uh, PEAT um, uh, stage, mm -hmm. or pre-service uh, uh, stage. Yeah. And then the other practitioner, uh, practical implication uh, is that, you know, we should encourage uh, those uh, PE teachers who are currently teaching in schools to receive uh, some additional professional development, uh, which are specific to CSPAP training. And, you know, as a matter of fact, such training are, uh, they are available at, you know, uh, state and national conventions of SHAPE, um, you know, or form the, the former uh, effort, right? And also through some state, uh, CDC, or public health departments. They often uh, provide grants for you know schools to institute CSPAP, and they also provide the power training, uh, you know, for people to get certified uh, uh, to you know make those things happen in schools. Right. So it it kind of seems like we have some work to do on the research end as well as the practical application by the PEEP programs. Um, I want to thank you for your time and all the work on synthesizing all this research. I know it's not easy. It's not a fast process. So I appreciate you putting this in a uh, concise place for people to, people to access. Um, can you let people know where they can find more information on current work you're doing or any uh, social media or anything like that? Uh Oh, yeah, well, they, uh, I enjoyed the process, and thanks for uh, inviting me and, you know, uh, to, you know, introduce uh, to me this great opportunity to interact with our, um, you know, um, researchers uh, and practitioners in the field uh, in this podcast. Uh, I really like the, the, uh, the title of this podcast, Playing with uh, Research in Health and Physical Education, and, you know, it's, it's a sensational idea. Um, you know, <laughs> you know, I should start to use social media to promote my scholarship. I do use Facebook and Instagram, but those are just for uh, personal use and leisure. Um, and I have I have a, a ResearchGate account and also a Google Scholar account. Uh, although I do need to do a better job in updating my uh, latest progress and and all that. Uh, but uh, I do. Um, sent my latest CV to our uh, staff here at LSU, and she uh, she would always, uh, you know, uh, update my CV on the LSU website. So, yeah, uh, you know, those of you who are interested in the kind of work uh, we are doing here at LSU, uh, yeah, feel free to, to email me or, you know, go to our website and, uh, and uh, check on, you know, the latest polls of... Uh, uh, research activities that, uh, that are happening here at LSU. So otherwise, you know, uh, as always, I enjoy networking with folks at conferences such as uh, ARA and SHAPE, and I will be attending both conventions this year, and I look forward to, uh, to meeting everybody uh, in Toronto and Tampa. Awesome. Uh, thank you. And uh, I got roped into Twitter this summer, so it's never too late, Senlin. You can start right now. It's a beautiful world out there. So, all right, man. Uh, thank you so much for your time. Uh, we're going to link to the article in the notes section. And that's all we have for you on this one. And uh, thanks for listening. Thanks a lot, Risto.